please welcome Brad Jennings. So before I do start, though, my question is, is so far, who uh, the people are doing paid search? Who really understands what hands campaigns are? And on about half of you are in paid search. Okay, so we might touch on real quick in hands campaigns. Um, who likes them? <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't like them? Okay, give me an idea of the number of actual paid search people in here. All right. <laughs> so for those of you who, who are newer to this page of Tarina, it essentially what enhanced are, you've got to be careful with Google Connect, because every three years something new comes up that's enhanced. So this is actually the third enhanced campaign they rolled out um, over the years. And, and so it essentially said, hey, you know what? Mobile devices and tablets and desktops, they're really not this different. Um, we need to make life easier for you as a marketer. You're too time strapped. We're going to combine all these things together, and then you can use these bid multipliers to change everything around so you can bid higher on mobile, or actually, you can't bid on desktops or tablets and family whatsoever. That was kind of the issue. And we'll give you these, some of these features. And so it's a step up for those who are never sophisticated because it does make the world more accessible of uh, doing more in less time. For anyone who is very sophisticated, it's a huge step backwards. And so often, the people who really care about this are the ones who were way advanced, and all of a sudden Google said, well, you're like this 1% of people out there. We don't need to support you because this 99% of spend is much bigger, so we're, you just go figure out your ways. So it's really, really what we've got to get into of how this case studies and advice kind of really plays to those who really want control again. Search marketing is really about control. Um, you also often hear the word optimization or optimizing our accounts. All that really means is when you start, Google has the control. And over time, you take the control back from them. So at the end, you know what's happening as opposed to them. It's all optimization really is at the end, is, is having control of your own spend. So the first study I want to start with is actually geography. Um, I grew up a lot in local search, a lot of the yellow page companies, newspapers, so I often turn to, to local first to kind of look at how paid search is applying to the local arena. Now, for the case that I'm going to walk through, first off, companies who have set their campaigns up around, here are my keywords for this geography, the ad matches the geography, the landing page matches their geography, they're not included because they should never combine their campaigns together. They've already segmented out their ads by user, by region. Enhanced campaigns is nothing for you um, in, in, that, in that range. What we really want to talk about are companies who have split out their campaigns due to budget reasons, CPAs being different in various places. So should you sort of recombine these together? And so in this first study, it was what, four accounts a um, decent sized account, so about two and a half million each a month. Uh, two were commerce and two were lead gen. So the, the question really is, is, should we simplify, right? That's what Enhance is about, is simplify. Should we simplify our campaigns and have less campaigns overall? And so what really sort of happens is when you look, and you can go to the Dimensions tab, and you can look at your CPAs by region. It is really common to have different conversion rates, and different cost per action by region. And if you don't separate this out, the bid is the same in Philly, where we've got a $45 CPA, as it is in San Antonio with a $91 CPA. You know, and if our target is, say, $65, we want to raise our bid in Philadelphia to get more volume and lower our bid in San Antonio. 
And so with enhanced campaigning, you can change your bids by every single individual geography if you want to. There's a lot of control to try to reach some of these targets. So in three enhanced campaigns, what we used to do is segment say, here's our best regions, our highest budget, our lowest CPA targets. Here's our secondary sets of regions. They don't do quite as well, lower budget, and then these regions, which are not very good, but we can't just say, we're ignoring you completely because we're a national company, so we just can't fully ignore region. But we don't want to spend a lot there. And so this is kind of how they were set up in, in various segments with legacy campaigns. And so you know, the question was, all right, let's make these one. My reps kept saying, just combine them, just combine them, you like it. So I eventually, you know, your reps are really salespeople, they're not reps. But um, so eventually, all right, let's actually try to combine these and see what happens. And so when we were doing CPC bid, controlling the bid on every keyword or every app, it was fantastic. It was so easy to add a new city, change the bid adjustment based upon the city. It worked really well when you're controlling the bid through CPC manipulation. But I do really like Google CPA bid system. When Google CPA bidding works, you don't have to worry about bidding. You can go focus on ad testing and landing page testing and the hard work of all the math of bidding is kind of out of the way. But the problem is, is bid adjustments don't work with CPA bids. So if you're not familiar with this, you can basically tell Google, my CPA is $65, change my bid until you figure out a $65 target. Great when it works, and it works more often than not. So when you're doing CPA bidding, this was horrendous. We had a, what, a 14% increase in CPAs. Nobody wants to see that. And it's because Google CPA bidding is not as aggressive at a, an individual local level as you probably are with CPC bidding. And so with CPA bidding, it really is best from this standpoint to say, here's our best regions, high budget, here's our second best regions, here's our third best, when you've got variety throughout a country. And then work with CPA bidding. It does work well if you give it better inputs. The better the input, the better the output. For doing CPC bidding, it actually is okay to combine all together. Use a bid modifiers. Okay, and the next one is continuing on the geographic theme is what happens if most of your conversions come from a small area and you want to try to increase it? So in this case, this was actually for um, a theater company, like the Guthrie, like actually play theaters. And they had locations throughout the US and almost always their conversions came from a 10 mile radius. And so the question was that if we essentially start doing a bit modifiers outwards, could we get conversions from further away just by using some bit modifiers to say, all right, if you're 10 miles away, that's our home base bid. If you're 20 miles away, we're going to bid 30% less. If you're 50 miles away, we'll bid half as much. So. And this I'm not gonna lie, this took a lot of work trying to figure out what the percentage should really be on this region basis. Now, one of the constraints though, and this is always where, whenever you get a case study, sometimes it's not about the data, it's about the constraints. One of the constraints was this company has annual marketing budgets segmented into cores. They don't ever have a test budget per se. So while we actually made it so that we could get these conversions at acceptable CPAs from further away, there was no way to get more total conversions because they couldn't raise the budget. So next year, will they raise the budget based upon this? Yes. There'll be a you know, 15, 20% increase in budget. But it was a case study, a proof of concept that actually can't be executed because of how the market market is structured. Um, so it's always important to look at potential constraints or well. Now, these are the ones where people kind of get sad with enhanced campaigns, uh, where we're only on mobile devices. We're, when we look at our clicks, our mobile was really good, our desktops were really bad, and we didn't advertise on desktops. They were kind of useless clicks in a lot of ways. And so this is one where I had to figure out, all right, if we're only on mobile, and now we have to have desktops. What is, is there a strategy that even will work? 
And so first off, if any of you are super sophisticated and broken up campaigns by network and carriers, you're done. There's nothing. You can't fix this whatsoever. This targeting is just gone. Um, we had a lot set up this way uh, because where we would see every network carrier combination would be different conversion rates. Now, when I would talk to, to Google about this post launch, I've talked to Head Mobile a lot about this. And, and he would always let me go, so this is really just a proxy to demographics. In, in reality, it is. You look at networks and phone types, you're really just reaching at different demographic sets based upon the type of carrier. Is it a regional carrier? Is it someone like a cricket? Is it a dumb phone? Is it a smartphone? So forth. And really it's a demographic proxy. In a way. And, and so, enhanced campaigns, one of their really big, they had a big underlying change was you set a bid, a base bid somewhere, ad word or card, ad group or keyword. But you can use these modifiers. It can be geography, time of day, devices to change your bids. If you add display to the mix, you can also change your bids by gender, by age ranges, by what site someone's on. So I think the next evolution that we'll see in enhanced campaign once the dust sort of settles with everybody is demographic bid modifiers for search. And this is where, when you see things like Google Plus, it's not about social networks. Yes, it is from Larry Page and Stockholm Japan. It, it is really about access to good data. This is where, when you look at you know, Microsoft, I mean, if you buy a computer, you have a, you have a Hotmail account or a Microsoft account, they know your billing address, you put in your age and gender. If you have an Xbox, you've done the same thing. Microsoft's data for individuals is amazingly rich. Yahoo, same way. Most people would open the Yahoo accounts six, seven, ten years ago. They have ten years of your data with Yahoo. Google doesn't have nearly as much information. They made a big change a couple of years ago where you can no longer sign up for Gmail without giving you or giving them addresses or not address, um, gender and age. Before, you didn't have to do that. So they're all way behind on some of the, the data, which is kind of funny because you Google behind the data, but yeah, they really are a little bit in this. And so I, I think one of the next evolutions we'll see in enhanced campaigns is demographic data adjustments, which will mitigate some of the downside we've seen. But in, until we really get tablet and mobile and tablet and desktop data adjustments, it'll never mitigate some 100 percent So so in this case, these were a little bit smaller account, but 13 accounts, spending about four million a month combined. So um, mostly people who were you know, larger plumbing company, did dot 20 plumbing trucks, were electricians and locksmiths. Um, in some cases, a few were actually lawyers. And, and so phone calls are valuable. That's the commodity at hand. It's not a, a chat on a website. It's not a contact form. It's actually getting so many on the phones. All that really matters. And with enhanced campaigns, you can't turn off desktops. So question one is, all right, if we make the most we can do signal-wise is give Google a max bid adjustment, 300% for mobile. We, we set our bids really low. We let our bid adjustment always at max. We do all of our ads with mobile preferred ads. We do no desktop-based ads. And, and that's as far as the mobile signals we can give them. And what happens from our percentage of clicks by device? So the best we could get to was still 19% of our clicks coming from desktop devices. That would essentially be a $1 you know, desktop bid, which is a $4 mobile bid, so a pretty big overall difference. The real issue comes into the cost for calls. Because with mobile, your, your click is a call. With desktop, you have a click, then you have to convince them to pick up the phone and call you. And so with legacy stuff, $23 mobile CPA, of course no desktop CPA, so it's $23 CPA. With enhanced, still a 23 mobile CPA. Now technically this is really about 24 and a half right now. There's been enough new campaigns that are mobile, I think they don't realize they are mobile. You're, you're people who get auto upgraded because they don't really know better. Um, and, and so now mobile CPA is a little bit higher now. Your desktop CPA is $114. This takes our blended CPAs from 23 to 41. No way around this. 
the, the best you can do at this point in time is most people who were in this boat had really tested out their mobile sites. They weren't putting money on desktops. They had often these really bad desktop sites. So the, the best you can do is start really playing with your desktop site, testing it, getting a phone number up there, getting call tracking in place so you can really see exactly what the queries are, leading to phone calls. But you're, you're not going to kill these in the foreseeable future. Google has given no indication we're going to allow for a, a desktop bid modifier. So the best you can do at the moment is try to at least focus that page around phone calls. And that's the most you can do at the moment. By the way, there is a way not to be on tablets. Um, Google has what they call a technology filter, where if you have a landing page which cannot be rendered correctly on a device, they won't show it. Now, Apple doesn't like Flash. So funny enough, this thing we've argued about how bad it is for so long Flash is actually useful to put on your site if you don't want to be on iPads. Um, so because Google says, oh, you've got a lot of Flash, we can't, your iPad can't render Flash, we won't show you here. Now, the new Nexus devices can render Flash, you're still going to be still on those tablets, but at least it gets you off of the, the more common tablet, which is iPad. Over, over other devices. So, because this technology filter, if you ever see a new device come out, come, that comes out, and it doesn't render something, that actually may be a way of not getting on the device and getting around some of Google's rules. So, what's happened then is we have these mobile modifiers, and they're they're often campaign level by default. But we can't do them at the active level. If they're a little hidden, I get them. You can do that with level one with bit modifiers. Which means you can start to segment these keywords based upon the kind of modifier you want to use for them. So, so for instance, uh, a campaign structure you see more and more now is here's our keywords which are only on desktops. These are commonly more long tail uh, keywords because no one searches for six keywords on a phone. Right, so you've got your, your longer tail queries and you don't even want them. And then you've got your short queries, and, and they're often so short, the volume on desktops is tremendous. But they're terrible converting on desktops. Where mobile devices, people again type shorter amounts, and these words on mobile devices are really good, they're terrible on desktops. So you've got this other campaign, you max out your bid modifier at 300%. Then you've got these other words. And these are better mobile, these are better desktops, there's no absolute device. They actually do work on mobile devices. So then you start to, to look at your ad group modifier and say, well, these three keywords in this ad group really need a positive modifier. And these three don't need a modifier at all. These four need a negative modifier. So if you're, hopefully don't have a massive account because this could take forever. But um, what you can start to do then is actually break out a single ad group into three or four subsets of ad groups based upon the modifiers. Now, this is really useful for your high volume keywords. If you get 20 impressions a month on a keyword, don't go to this level. You will be wasted. Well, in data, hell, because we know with data, you can, right, you can get sucked into data, and all of a sudden, there's, there's no rights. Um, so your high volume stuff, really useful. Low volume, don't even try this. But the, the problem is, this is great for high volume, but you've taken an ad group, but hopefully you've already segmented well, right? You've got your keywords, they reflected in your ads, reflect the landing page. You've got this really nice tight set of ad groups. And you just split it in three. So now the problem often comes in an ad survey is if you have a query which can match the multiple keywords, what ad group actually gets the impression? Because that matters back to your modifier. Right? Did I bring everyone along with that thought? Okay, good. Um, so, so this is where what you want to be, make sure then is that you're maintaining control over what ad is really being displayed for the query, and with these all these bid modifiers, what bid is actually being used with modifier. So that the easiest way to do this is actually to create a simple pivot table. You take your search queries. Here's the query. Here's the number of keywords per ad group. What's the number? 
And this is an actual account, and they really do have some queries being shown from 129 managers. Think they have control over this? Not at all. Right? So there are times this number may be bigger than one. If you have a campaign that's set to only LA, a campaign set to only Vegas, a campaign set to only Minneapolis, of course you have a query shown from multiple actors. But in that case, you want to do this kind of analysis at the campaign level, not the account level. If you have an account, though, that's all Minnesota or all nationwide, then you could do this kind of analysis at the account level. Say, all right, let's, let's look and say, wow, we've got these eight keywords, or these whatever keywords, are being shown from multiple ad groups. We've lost that survey control. And, and so that's where negatives then sort of come into play. So negatives are often put at the wrong level. When you look at, at negative keywords, you have negative keyword lists. This is a big list of keywords you can add. You can then apply the list to any campaign or all your campaigns. As you find new negatives you never want to be shown for, you add them to the list, they ought to get applied to all the campaigns. Negative lists are huge time savers. You then have campaign negatives. These are four words you want to show from campaign A, but you don't want to show from campaign B. That's what campaign negatives are. Then you have ad group negatives. Ad group negatives are when you want to show from ad group A, but not ad group B. Because of the design of the AdWords interface, often when you're looking at the search query data, you add queries to the, our negative keywords to the ad group, not the campaign. So you often end up with way too many ad group negatives. You're just kind of chasing queries around, and they should just go straight to the campaign or, or straight to the campaign lists, negatives instead. And so when you have these ad groups where you've got multiple ads being shown, often this is so much easier than Excel in the AdWords interface, it's just list out, here's my ad groups, here's my potential conflicts, what ad group negatives should I need? So this is for a hosting company. So when you, when you look at this, if someone searches for, cheap, okay, let's say assume we have an ad group that's hosting, an ad group website hosting, an ad group cheap hosting, an ad group VPS, virtual private server hosting, and then cheap virtual private server hosting. So if we have modified broad match in every one of these ad groups, good match type to you, and someone searches for cheap VPS website hosting, Every single ad group could match to that query. Google's going to take your best ad rank, your, your max CPC times pro score, and pick what shows. So if this query is done 100 times, you're going to have impressions from every single ad group. And so to, to maintain that control then, say, all right, for the least specific ad group, in this case the hosting one that's the least specific, we make negatives that should apply to all the other ad groups. Our second least specific, which would be our, our website hosting, we add our queries that are more specific ones, and so forth, so forth. So you kind of make this chain. So now when someone searches for cheap VPS website hosting, the only ad group that could show is the cheap VPS hosting package, and, and down the line. And this takes some initial work to kind of think through, most specific to, to least specific, but it ensures that you always know, right, control. You always know what ad is shown and what landing page is shown to the user so that if you're doing landing page tests and ad tests, you, you really do know that they're appropriate. Because if you don't do these negatives, all of a sudden you're going to look at the hosting ad group ad test and say, well, this is the best ad. And what might have happened is this was the best ad for these three ad groups over here, but not the words that are really left. And so you want to make, make sure you've got that, that control going on of what Google really picks. So going back to some case studies. So one of the benefits, positive things of enhanced campaigns is the fact that you can do a lot of ad extensions at the ad group level or campaign level. You can turn on time of day targeting for them. You can make them mobile specific or just all devices. So this is actually Really, the positive part of the pants had to deal with the extensions. And, and so the, the question was, at the global site, is there accounts that had changed the way their campaigns worked just for seconds? And this was before the latest uh, AdWords editor update, which now makes this a lot easier. So essentially, if you had to go into the interface and pick all these segments, it's a whole lot of work. 
would they would they be better for you? Or should you just use campaign level cycles? Should you really actually try to tailor all your ad group level ones? Because it's it's not a quick process. And so that's the reason with 90 e-commerce accounts, about 100 grand a month each, did not want to pick a big account at all for this because it really was buy and create the cycles for every single ad group. And then the way they were, the test was structured was we've got low value items. This means low sale price. So it could be a pair of socks or something. So low sale price. In that case, our site links are focused around selling a similar value item, uh, more of a, a cross sell type of uh, item. Now we've got high value items. So it's like a suit. So in that case, we're selling a $600 suit. Our site links are going to be around upsell up to 50% of the value price. So ties, shirts, shoes, etc. And then we've got these ambiguous queries. The ones where the user's query is so ambiguous, you don't know what ad to show. Like the term dresses. Prom dresses or wedding dresses, the evening dresses, the cocktail dresses, the sun dresses. Nobody has any idea what the user actually wants. And so in that case, the site links are for much, much more specific based items. And of course, the ultimate question, after all this work, do we make any more money, right? That's always a question at the end. And so for the low value ad groups, found that the CTR difference was not even statistically significant. The conversion rate difference, same thing, they weren't significant. The average order value was slightly higher, enough that I'm not still sure if it's an anomaly or if it's repeatable on a test. And it seems for low value items, yeah, your campaign settings are probably good enough, uh, especially since they're not easy to, to make these in mass. Now, for high value items, so again, we're, we're selling a suit, our upsells are shirts and ties and shoes and so forth. Uh, CTR went up 0.3%. That's a meaningful number. Um, the conversion rate went up 0.2%. Again, a meaningful number. Now, the average order value. Up to 11 percent. That's again a very meaningful number. The reason why is someone would search for a suit and just buy the shoes or just buy the tie, which which means the average order value does drop because of course you know, 200 bucks on a suit, 600. But the overall net effect was highly profitable. And this good. So what's interesting is, is in the study, we had a few different companies in it. And one company, the the marketing manager said. Well, this is terrible. And I was like, what do you mean it's terrible? You just made another $20,000 this month. And we're like, well, we get judged. One of our judgments is average order value. And so all of a sudden, their KPIs were, were against the, their profits. And so I was like, all right, we need to get your boss on the phone. We need to talk about KPIs or measuring here because this is not good when you think this is negative. And, and so that's one of those that sometimes I financially test. Someone will say it's great, someone else will say that was terrible. Um, but this was net effect was, was great overall for these companies because they were as, the average order value dropped with this, these increasing conversions were things you never would have sold, you know, the accessories to the items. Now my biggest hopes are the ambiguous items. Because we all have these terms, shirts. What do you really want? Like give me a better query to work with, right? And, and so in that case, this was fantastic. Um, CTR went up um, almost 0.63%. Uh, Conversion rates went up 0.5%. Average order value dropped slightly. That is an effect of the seasonality. So in the springtime, you have sundresses coming out, which are much cheaper than cocktail dresses and so forth. Um, I'm repeating this term right now. It actually looks like a jump. And it's because cocktail dresses and, and fall dresses are more expensive than summer ones. So that is not an effect of the cycling. That's effect of the seasonality of the items being sold. And so for the ambiguous group, this was fantastic. Really enjoy how this worked for them. Because it's one of those, like, the salespeople are the boss that we got to show for this keyword. And you look at the metrics, and you say, it's a terrible word for us to show for. And at least now you can start to direct traffic into queries that are, are more likely to, to lead to the conversion. And so, with site links, you know, these are the, just to make sure, these are the little links that show below the ad when they're above the fold. That's the thing. Only when they're in the premium positions do site links display. 
So when you want to sort of say, all right, where should we start with these? Go to your account. You can segment top versus up. Top means they're in those premium positions. Sort impressions highest to lowest. So now look at your top impressions with the most. That's usually the places to sort of start with site links and then go from there. Now, what is nice is Google's UI for site links is horrendous. It's awful. Trying to manage them in there is not very pretty right now. The latest AdWords editor, uh, who launched like about two weeks ago, supports AdGroup level site links bulk imports. So you can now go to your e commerce system, have someone run a query that basically says, for this apparel type, these are the top four cross sales, or these are the top four ones that we see someone buy with this product. And run the queries in the database, put them into an Excel format, upload, you're done. Um, it's not quite that simple, but you know it's not that hard either. Because hopefully you're not doing all the queries, you're asking the question, the developers are getting the data for you. Um, they're doing really the hard work here, actually, in this case. And so it's actually pretty simple now if you've got a hopefully one, at least one developer to staff to understand your database um, to pull this for the site link information. All right, so the, the day parting or changing bids by time of day it is actually not new. Um, it was first introduced in 2006. What is new is how much people are using this bid modifier because now it's more front and center than it ever was previously. And so with this, you can say, I want to bid more, you know, 10 to 2 Monday to Wednesday, or I want to bid more on Sunday evenings, or I want to bid less, or we don't even answer the phone after 5 o'clock. We'll then shut off your ads after 5 o'clock if you don't answer the phone. Right? Simple things to do with it. But the, the problem is most marketers go into the dimensions type of adverts, and they run two reports. They run one that says, give me my CPA by a day of the week. They turn around and run it again and say, give me my CPA or my conversion rate, whatever metrics you run the stock of, by time of day. And we combine these, and I'll set my bid modifiers. This is terrible, because it, in a lot of industries, you see very different B2B versus B2C behavior. The problem is there's more work days than weekends. All of us know this. Right? You work five days a week, you only get two days off. And so often that Monday to Friday during work hours obscures all the interesting data on the weekends. And, and so this is not the way you should ever run this analysis. This is an older case study of mine where it's a B2B company and their goal is a white paper download. That's what they want. And so, if you just know the dimensions have it run this, it looks like you should beef up your bids Monday to Friday, uh, 9 to 11, 1 to 3 walk away. Now, when you really get into the data, what happens is Tuesday, daytime is their best day. Their second best time is Sunday evenings. What happens is roughly 2 or 3 on Fridays, the web just dies. Right? Everyone's figuring out where are we going to dinner, or what's our bar plans, or our movie plans, whatever, for the weekend. No one does it work. Then you, you like Sunday, you're like, oh shoot, I've got a report to do for my boss on Monday, I better get this done. So for some companies, Sunday evenings a great, great night. If you only use the dimensions app, you can never see that insights. And so with analytics, this is hopefully if you're using either Omniture or Google Analytics, it's easy to run. Um, you can run it where you can say, give me my campaign name then day of the week, then hour of day, pull down your downloads, put them in a graph in Excel, and you can easily spot the modifiers. So that's really the way you want to do this analysis, is through analytics, not through dimensions of adverts. By the way, if you write down this URL, and you run the report and it doesn't work, it's because of the goal sets. Um, everyone usually has different goals they use inside of uh, Google Analytics for things. So if you just hit the edit button, switch the goals to whatever goals you actually want to see, it should work without a problem. Um, and if you've got a small account, you don't need to segment by campaign. You might not need to. In some cases, you want to segment by campaign first. But that is the way before you suddenly raise or lower bids by a time frame, make sure you're using the correct data. And analytics will give you much better data for this than AdWords will in making this decision. How about time? I'm good on time, 
So there wasn't like 10 minutes left or 12 minutes right after school. All right. Is 721 perfect? Okay. I can go on forever about this stuff, so be sure. So the, the topic that is not talked about enough with enhanced campaigns is policy. This is this is one of the hidden, real big negatives with, with enhanced campaigns. And the reasons why is when you look at quality score, this number is held at the Keyword, ad copy, defines geographic, so forth, intersection. Now, you just see this one roll of number. But before, we can at least see this roll of number by the price type. And, and so this is where one of the issues is that, you know, I would have a legacy, I had some of the old campaigns, where my cross from mobile was nine, desktop is five, and hands is just six. So what, what I really don't want to know is six. I want to know, hey, your mobile is great, your desktop needs help. Or I want to know, hey, your, your desktop is great, your mobile needs help. And so if you see things like low landing page quality score, you don't actually know what device that applies to. So just starting to change your landing page is a terrible idea because you may be changing the wrong one. If you've got a mobile site and a desktop site, you can't just change it. Now if your site's respond to design, and again, you still want to look at a little deeper into the metrics. But this is one of the big popular things. So, number one, when you, when you see things like expected CTR is low or relevancy is low, what that really means is test records. I mean, at the end, that's really what it's about is you need to do some ad testing. And, and so, what you really want to do then is go to that ad group where you've got that keyword that's not doing well, segment your ads by device. In this case, we have our computer CTR is a 1.95% preposition 1.2. That's just low. Where our mobile CTR is 5.85%. You know what? It's not our mobile ads. They're fine. We need to change the ads to be mobile preferred and test our desktop ads. So you do want to do some segmentation of your click-through rates by device type before you just start doing the ads. And that's where we have this concept now of effective device, which probably isn't mentioned enough. So let's say you have a campaign, and it is set to desktops and mobile devices both. If you just make an ad, and you don't set any mobile preference, it's on both devices. Now, if you make an ad in an ad group, can you make it mobile preferred? And you don't make any non-mobile preferred. Technically, that ad is also shown on all devices, even though you have a mobile bid for it. And then you've got desktop-only ads, which means that ad group has at least two ads in it. One does not have a mobile flag. One does have a mobile flag. So this is where Google's not really showing, I, I'm just calling it effective device. Essentially, what devices are these ads really being shown on? So in our previous example, we would go in and we would take our 5.95% CTR ad and say, you're mobile only. And then we say, let's go write a couple more desktop ads so that we can test to see how we do on that particular device type. Now, this also goes for landing pages. So again, this is Google Analytics. You can, most analytics is the kind of stuff. Where we've got, here's our, our URL. In this case, it relates to a keyword. Here's our effective device category. And there's our bounce rate. So what is our bounce rate by keyword by device type? If we see this keyword has a 95% bounce rate on mobile, and it's got a 22% bounce rate on desktop, our desktop is fine. Our mobile site needs this. Now, bounce rate by default in Google is a one page page view, regardless of time on site. So if someone goes to your page, they pick up the phone, they call you, they spend 27 minutes on the phone, they leave your site, analytics says it's a bounce. So the way GA works is someone goes to your page, script loads. Nothing happens. Someone goes to a second page, script loads again. Google knows page one. So there is this concept known as 
adjusted bounce rates. And if you search for the adjusted bounce rates, there's a Google Analytics blog post that ranks number one. And essentially what you can do then is you can change your code to say, after 30 seconds, fire an event, or after one minute, fire an event. And that means that a 60 second visitor is no longer a bounce. And so if you have a page whose true focus is just phone calls, you might have a 98% bounce rate and a 98% call rate. Well, that'd be great. <laughs> so in that case, adjusted bounce rates are much better to use than bounce rates. Now, just in case you have, just to avoid the confusion in the future, Google does not use bounce rates for quality score purposes. What they use, well, they will never actually say they use this. They say, I can't tell you that we use this. That's what they sort of answer that is. They use bounce back rates. And this is only important for, for getting into a specific discussion with your colleagues, but a bounce is essentially a non-interactive visit. They went to one page and it's like five seconds up. So when it goes to your page close to the browser, Google doesn't know they're a bounce. So a bounce back is someone who went to your site, hit the back button, went back to Google's page, now they know time on your site. So technically, Google does not use bounce rates. They use bounce back rates. Well, it gets a little bit different in, in the verbiage. Google can easily say, we don't use bounce rates. That's all everyone really asks them. I mean, so this gives you a better idea then, is it a device issue we're having on our site? When you try to, when you see those little landing page quality score issues. And so you can still make quality scores better. It's just that the typical procedure you would take is still the exact same. It's more of a matter of, Make sure you're doing the mobile or desktop correctly. All right, last section, I believe. So now we have this concept of device I talked about. And so it's important then is ad testing, of course, is super important. It's important for quality scores, for, for click-through rates, of course, for conversions of profit at the end of things. But the issue is most people will look at it's a little small, hopefully you don't need glasses. Um, will look at this and say, all right. Ad one has the best look through rates, it has the best conversion rate, it has a lower cost per acquisition, and has a higher CPI. You know what? Ad one is the winner. And, and technically, that's right, unless you say, no, I don't know enough. Because if we segment this by device, we have two completely different sets of Averages hide every useful, meaningful number. You can never look at an average. You gotta look at segmented data and get into the details. And so in reality, ad one is the best mobile ad. Ad two is the best desktop ad in this case. So we really do need to, to use those effective devices and say, this is for desktop, this is for mobile. And so where in your ad group, you need to make two mobile ad preferred ads, two non-mobile preferred ads. Of course, there are cheaper ways of doing this because that's a whole lot of ads. And you've essentially at least doubled, if not tripled, if you're doing three, four, or five ads at the time. How many ads are you doing? So, the, the first thing to start with, though, is this again another simple pivot table, is where do you really, how are your ads being displayed now? So, if you go to your ad tab, download the data, make a pivot table, and if you don't know what a pivot table is, um, Microsoft has great help videos with 2007 stuff. They will change the way you analyze data forever. Um, they're, they're fantastic, fantastic things to do. And this is just essentially a pivot table that says, give my ad groups, show me ads per ad group and ads with mobile flags. That's all it is. And then do a conditional formatting that if the number's under one, make it red. So in, in ad groups here, I don't have mobile ads, so I'm only testing this stuff. But I've got this other one, this right column here, where I only have mobile ads. I don't have desktop. My mobile ads technically are desktop ads now. And so this is sort of an easy way of seeing where do we potentially have some ad serving issues or some analysis issues. To so then create our ads properly by each ad group. Now, there is a cheater method, right, to, to do this. Now, again, whenever there's a cheat shortcut, there's negatives associated. So the, the easy way to do it is say, oh, I'm just going to write three ads. I'm going to put in my ad groups. When I go to test the data, I will do a segment. 
if they're mobile fast, I'm going to hit the edit button. This is what the problem comes in. I'm going to hit the edit button, hit the mobile bit flag, and hit save again. So the best on desktops, I'm just going to keep it. My worst bad is I'll hit the delete button. The problem with that is every time with Google you hit the edit button on an ad, change something and save it, and in Google's mind you didn't edit something. You deleted ad one, you created ad two. So all of a sudden, you've got to go back to reapproval, and you may not have the best distribution. So in 90% of cases, things come back the same. 10% of cases, for whatever reason, they don't. And so that is the one potential problem of using a shortcut. Now, the advantage is you're not doubling your work. So many people consider that a larger advantage than 10% of my stuff doesn't come back by the same way. So it's what do you have more of, right? Is it time? Write your ads. Is it I've got so many ad groups, I, I have to use shortcuts, that then use a shortcut method. So, but just know that there, there's a difference in that. All right, and so with that, if, by the way, I'm, I've got a book out, the second edition does not have an ant, third will, third will not be up to the spring, though. So this is the thing, we just started the third edition. If anyone looked, seen the book, it's big, by the way, so it's not a white read, it's like 600 pages, I think. <laughs> the next is going to be another 40, I think. So, that will be next spring, though, there'll be another edition of that. All right, questions on all of this? <laughs> yes? How closely is Google following your global preferred options? <laughs> you know, I'm worried about that preferred. Well, you know what? How close is Google watching your preferred options? I find that roughly 5% of my ads are shown from the non-preferred ad. 5% of my impressions. So I do find that I will have mobile-only ads shown to desktops. I will have desktop-only ads shown to mobile devices. I find it's roughly 5%. Now, the real problem is, is if you use responsive design, that 5%, okay, it's a margin of error. We just flip it. The real issue is, is when you have absolute URLs to a website that is optimized for a device, and your website doesn't do a device to text. Because now you're serving a desktop page on a mobile device, or a mo worse, a mobile page on a desktop device, and mobile sites don't look good on desktops at all. <laughs> That's really my issue, but I, I roughly see it's 5%. Do you see the same thing? Uh, no, I haven't checked. Okay. You're gonna see some. You're gonna. I, I've seen some for everybody. It's, you know, I mean, there is a lot going on in you know, 0.13 seconds of what you know it takes to do all this. But yeah, there are definitely some issues. Yes. Take it the flip side. So now you just have to modify a goal to make it one percent. You're just going to target that top Yeah. So what's weird is, okay, so if you do a minus 100% modifier, you're technically not on our device. Now for 85% of accounts that look at, if they're not being shown on mobile. I'm seeing some that are. And what I'm trying to figure out is it's mobile because it's an ambiguous device and it's a, like the Galaxy Note. It's a 5.5 inch phone, right? So is that a phone or is it a tablet, right? And so I don't know if it's a device issue that we're doing that's the problem and Google's moving to a, because I know they're moving to a screen resolution serving them, right? So if you make something that's 11 inches and call it a phone, it's still not a phone, right? Um, and, and so that's where I don't want, I have no idea if it's a technology issue or a true ad serving issue. Yes? I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you something that's going to make me cry a little bit. I, I don't always get custom landing pages. So, that's fun. So, when you say that if the page doesn't render correctly, it won't show it for you said tablet, but I'm assuming that you've got mobile as well. Yeah, you got any device. Okay, what does render correctly mean? Because if there's a site that was built in 2009, I don't know if you it's, it's a, a technology. It's a technology filter. 
So it's not how ugly the page is, right? That, that's an aesthetic thing. It shows up, but it's not usable. Like it's uh, usable again, it is, okay. is again a, uh, and it's a tech thing with this technology. Great. Does the device support JavaScript? Does the site use JavaScript? Does the device use Flash? Does the, or, or, right, the site use Flash? Does the device support Flash? So it's more about the technology, not the usability. There's no way for Google to automate usability of, of every device out there. So it's a pure technology. Okay. Yes? There are um, a lot of Google products that are like so for the, so for search, uh, there are times I use them all. No question, because there's only three for search. Right? You've got time of day, uh, geographic, and and uh, mobile. So there's only three. With display, I think the two or three that really matter to me because display you have been modifiers for let's see, keywords. No, keywords are always base. So you have modifiers for topics, interests, age, gender, and the website itself. And I feel like I'm missing one. I believe there's six, might be even seven modifiers for display. Well, so not, like the, what? The Other like, well, that's that's our interest. That's still considered, I think, an interest target. But so in that case, I really say, what do I care? are not that useful on display because only like 25% of people are really classified age and gender by Google, right? So you might say, well, let's ignore the audience if Google really knows what the audience, but we don't really necessarily all the really modifiers for that. So usually when you look at display, it's you're, you're really targeting topics, interests, placements, or keys. One of those four things is your base. So then that, that's the base I'm starting with. And I might add one or two additional modifiers for display. Oh, I know the other one for display. It goes back to mobile. Um, yeah, mobile and geography. Today, for Facebook. Um, so I might add a couple more, but I can't say if I were to have seven modifiers on display, I would never know what the fit is. I would have no idea if I would just know if I'm hitting a CK or not. I would not know what level you can pull it. So on display, I, I won't use more than, say, one or two more modifiers. And I'm more likely to use the base ones, right? The device type, the geography, than I am to set one modifier for uh, a topic, and a second modifier for a cat for interest on a keyword. That just seems kind of ridiculous. That's what we did Yes? Are you using a particular threshold, like we only need to go so far in one direction, a particular type of modifier. So no, mobile is so. No matter what, Google will never do a bid a hundred, ten times more than your base. So even if you use every, so initially when it came out, I did the math on one dollar click for for display could be a four million dollar bid. There were that many modifiers, and then and then so Google launched a cap that said 10, 10, 10 x initial bids most will ever go. On. Uh, so with, with mobile only, your cap is 300%. All the other modifiers are 900% except mobile. Uh, so if there's a subset traffic I really want, then I'll hit 900% on it. Now for geography, I don't think it's ever happened, quite honestly, for geography. It's more likely to be, this time of day is fantastic. We're a catering business and it's 10.30 in the morning. We, we want just the highest bid that's actually possible. Or, we have a display campaign that we find like these topics are doing super well, but these two placements are amazing, but Google doesn't let us place to target them. Therefore, we add them as keywords, the name of them, and then jack up the bits for that. Right? They're usually like, we don't, we have to take this other stuff, but we really only want these. And that's usually what those max modifiers are for. Oh, yes, go ahead. Um, No, no, 
Well, so this was for the conversion rates of one company for those particular places. So this is, yeah, this is, so this is a company with an offering which is, I can't break the NDA, so this is for a company who sells a product that is mostly bought by people who live in the suburbs or live outside of the city, so it could be a completely rural area, who make under 60000 per year as a house. So, so, oh, and, I right, um, yeah. and so there's actually a bunch of them. There's a bunch of things that fall into that. And, and they spend almost a million dollars every week. No, they, yeah, a million dollars a week on, on mobile. Um, and so, like, this is this display represents something that's ridiculous. How that's but so that's where you see a, an iOS user on Verizon is someone who really liked Verizon network and waited until Apple came to them. So when you look at demographics by carrier, it goes, most, Verizon's the, the actual, people make the most of Verizon. Then it goes to um, AT&T, then to Sprint, then to T-Mobile, then to Metro PCS, then to Cricket. And you can layer out exactly how much people make at uh, baseline the carrier. Um, Apple phones are either bought by people who are more fluent or people who want to be known as technology adopters or people who want to be the first in a small town to say, oh, look, I've got the school thing. Um, or, or an Android phone is more ubiquitous the marketplace that may not offer either tied to Google products they don't actually make as much as, as I was just on app, and of course there's all kinds of individual exceptions here. Um, and so then when you kind of put the board together, you can start to see that if we have, and this is what the opposite, right? If we were selling um, surface computers, right, a very niche product, this would be completely flipped. Um, but that's where you can sort of look to say, who's the kind of user you want to reach, and what is their technology? And if you were later on, what we don't have here is layered on city versus world, right? So you've got cities of over five million, cities one to five million, cities of 500,000 million in totally rural areas, you would see another segment of how the conversion rates work. And so this kind of goes back to your target market, right? Whenever you do set your marketing campaigns, who do you want to reach, right? What are the technologies they use? Where do they live? Where do they work? Um, and is there any way, the, uh, like all these options with you know AdWords or whatever method we're using, of uh, putting that message to that particular user base? And so if you're doing social, right, you're watching hashtags. So if you want to reach a group of people who are 25 to 40, who um, let's see, 25 to 40, who are early technology adopters and make more than. Uh, actually usually 30 to 60 grand a year, you're going to watch for the Big Bang Theory hashtags and advertise that live on real time. Right? So when you sort of like layer out, like what does my market look like, what's my method of reaching them, whether it's a Twitter hashtag, an AdWords account, or whatever, that lets you really say, we only want these. These come along for the ride, and they're not going to be bad people necessarily. You know, we're going to fit something for them. We'll get some conversion for them. But at the end, this little group is all we really want to spend our money on, or at least target overall. And that's how any marketing methods on my work. So it, it really is that, that traditional marketing plan. And this is where online is so weird these days because most people who grew up are not marketing degrees. Right? Their degrees are in literature and sciences and maybe statistics. That's a great one. Uh, minds and psychology. Right? And, and so this is where you've got need still for traditional marketers who understand what a SWOT analysis is can put together a marketing plan. If you find some a lot of experience, they really have marketing groups. Uh, and so, I, I know I've got the system as my SWOT analysis for me, right? I'm like, here's the big things I think we should do. You work on this. Um, I'm responding to for years. You know, but, but it's, so who has a marketing group? All right, who has a statistics degree? Who's a liberal arts degree? Right? That's as much as marketing, right? So that's that's really an interesting, you know, dichotomy you see in in online marketing where you see a lot of VPs and a lot of executors who have degrees in you know classical literature who are writing marketing plans. Um, it's it's something you would never see in 
television or radio or so forth, but you do see it online. So very, it's very, when Sid was 14 years old. Um, so it's very, very, well, paid service is 14 years old. Organic is 17 years old, I think. But that's all we're talking about. So it's, it's very different than that. So that was a tangent. Yes? Do you have a promo code for us for your monthly membership? Well, I should have done that. That would, that would have made a whole lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't, but you know what? If you go to our site and write in, I will give you one. It will be me, actually. I just need to write a note on my phone, and it'll exist in like a couple hours. Just email it to me. We'll get it out. Yeah, yeah. Well, I need to remind myself to actually do this. <laughs> um, otherwise, it will not occur. But, so. Okay. It will exist a little bit. Yes? So you, you've already optimized the campaign based on, say, geo uh, and outliers. Um, how do you kind of refresh that analysis once you are running those outliers? So if you have, so essentially you, you, you've done your geographic analysis, you made all your assessments, and so now you have no fresh data set to go back to see how it's actually going, right? Um, I would, that's when I turn to analytics and the organic stuff. And so essentially, let's grab, and not provided makes this not fun to do, but, but at least we can you know, use our landing pages, proxy the keywords, and so forth, right? And, and still do a geographic analysis with the organic stuff. I would not use my social data for it because it's different interaction and geographies mean different things, but I would, and it's not search. So I would use my organic data to redo the analysis, but there's not a way to otherwise to do it. So your other option is to save that, right? Like, like preserve this in Amber. Let's duplicate everything for two weeks. Let's do the analysis on this fresh data. We can decide whether we were right, we, we, we ruined the Amber or not, or we redo it again. I mean, those are your only options. What other hand? 